Okay, so for part one of homework 4-3 here. Uh, question one, if the force on an object is in the negative direction, the work it does on the object must also be. Um, and don't get fooled by this one, right? Just because the force is going in whatever I've defined as the negative direction, that doesn't mean the work has to be negative, right? The only time work is negative we know is when the force and the displacement are in opposite directions. So if the force was going in the negative direction, and the object was still moving in the positive direction, then it would be negative work, but it doesn't say the object's moving in the positive direction. So the work could be either positive or negative depending on the direction that the object moves. If the force is going in the negative direction and the object also moves in the negative direction, then it would still be positive work. So be careful about that. Just because the force here is in the negative direction doesn't mean the work has to be negative. So question two is another good concept question asking about as a ball is thrown upward and the direction or the sign of work. So again, as a baseball is thrown straight up, compare the sign of work done by gravity while the ball goes up and the sign of work done by gravity while it comes back down. Well, while the ball is moving up, right, if we throw a baseball straight upward, we know that the force of gravity is always pulling downward. So as the ball continues to rise, as the ball continues to move upward, the force of gravity is working opposite of that direction so the work would be negative, right? The work would be a negative number as the ball rises. However, as the ball returns, as the ball reaches the highest point and then falls back down, now the displacement is downward and the force is downward. So on the way back down, the work would now be positive, right? So the work is negative on the way up and positive on the way down. So option C is my best option for that question. Question three is a good one for comparing, right? It's using our equation and then changing some of the variables to make a comparison. So it says a truck has four times the mass of a car and is moving twice the speed. Um, and then they give us KT is the kinetic energy of the truck and KC is the kinetic energy of the car. So for the car, the kinetic energy of the car would just be one half, right? The mass of the car times the velocity of the car squared. For the truck, it would still be one half the mass of the truck, however, is twice as much as the car, and the uh, excuse me, the mass of the truck is four times, right, as massive as the car, and then the velocity is twice as much, right. So how does that change? Well, look again. You have to look at what changes, and what I mean by that is the one half actually didn't change, right. So don't be thrown off by that. I have this extra factor of four times the mass, and then because I'm squaring the velocity, this actually ends up being four v squared. So I actually get an extra factor of 16 times as much right energy. So I end up with 16 times as much kinetic energy for the truck as I do the car. So that's why option A is the correct option for this one. Right again, don't be distracted. I know sometimes the most common mistake that I see on this is probably if you followed out with that one half, you would say one half times 16 is eight. Um, but hopefully you realize, hey, that option's not up here, so that doesn't make any sense. Um, but watch out for little details like that. Um, hopefully this one though made sense. Right, just look at what factors changed. The one half did not change. Question four here is another very good concept question because it goes a little bit against your intuition. And what I mean by that is if you look at the options, which one requires more work? To go from zero to 30 or 50 to 60, which one requires more work? Well, your gut probably says to go from zero to 30 is a change of 30 miles per hour. So surely that's going to take more work than to go from 50 to 60, right? Because that's only a change of 10 miles per hour. But if you actually look at the, the relationship, right, we know that work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, right? One of our theorems, the work kinetic energy theorem, says that work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So let's consider the change in kinetic energy for each of these two situations. Well, for the first one, we know that the initial kinetic energy would be one half the mass times zero because it's not moving, right? So one half the mass times the velocity of zero Obviously, when I square that, that still ends up being zero. So the initial kinetic energy was zero. And then the final kinetic energy, I don't know the mass, but I'm not necessarily worried about that. So it'd be one half mass times 30 for my, my velocity there squared. Right, that ends up being 30 squared ends up being 900. So if you want to keep the one half and the, the m in there, you get 450 m, right? So the final kinetic energy would be 450 m. So then this one experiences a change of 450 minus zero, so it experiences a change in kinetic energy of 450 m, whatever that mass may be. Let's compare then the same thing for my second situation. So the work done for my second scenario is still the change in kinetic energy, right? Well, the initial kinetic energy, 
would not be zero, it'd be one half, right, the mass times 50 squared. Well, 50 squared is 2,500, right? And so half of 2,500 is 1,250. So this gives me an initial kinetic energy of 1,250. My final kinetic energy would be very similar to that, right? One half mass times 60 squared. Well, 60 squared is 3,600. When I do half of that, it's 1,800, right? So it's 1,800 m. So if I look at the change in kinetic energy here, well, if I do 1,800 m minus 1,250 m, I actually see that that one ends up being 550 m, which 550 is more than 450, right? No matter what that variable m is, 550 is definitely a larger number than 450. So the second scenario actually requires a higher change in energy, and therefore it requires more work to bring it up that, that from 50 to 60 instead of from 0 to 30. So again, counterintuitive here. Probably a lot of us wanted to say from 0 to 30 makes the most sense. Um, but as the velocity increases higher and higher and higher, it takes more energy to increase that velocity because we're squaring that number. So a very good question to make sure you're comfortable with, hopefully one that you spend some time to think about and feel pretty comfortable working your way through. Question five here is a pretty straightforward plug and chug type question, just getting comfortable with our new equations to work with here. So the potential energy stored in the spring, well the potential energy, keep in mind sometimes they use that U to represent it, right? So U sub S is what I'll call it for the spring potential energy. Well the equation just says we need to know one half, we need to know the spring constant K, which they give me, and I need to know the change in uh, compression or stretching, right, the change in displacement, which they tell me it's been compressed a distance of 3.50 centimeters. It is very important I pay attention to the fact that that's centimeters. So this is actually 0 0.035 meters, right? But uh, other than that, other than watching your units, this is a pretty easy question. So the spring potential energy equals 1 half my constant of 55 times my compression of 0 0.035 squared. Again, probably the, the most common mistake that I'll see is if we just forget to convert that. So watch out for that. Um, but otherwise, just calculating this number, and I get about 0 0.0337 joules of energy stored in the spring. Okay, so if you've compressed the spring that far, this is how much energy it would be storing in that compression. Question six is also not a bad question as soon as we realize the uh, energy relationship involved here. So you've got an 85 gram, and notice again, watch the units, that is 85 grams. So if we're working with the mass, we'll need the mass to be kilograms. So I'm going to go ahead and make a note of that there. right? But we've got that wooden block that's pressed into a spring. It rests on a smooth surface, so I don't have to worry about friction. It's pushed into the spring and compresses at a distance of 2 centimeters. So again, my delta X would be in meters, so 0 0.02 meters. Then it's released. The spring constant may give us a 78. What is the speed of the block when it reaches its initial position where the spring was not compressed? So again, basically what's happening here is we've got the spring, we've got the block. The spring is originally this long, right? It's got its original length, L sub zero, or whatever you want to call that. And then I push the block into it. And as I push the block into it, I've compressed it 0 0.02 meters. Well, as I compress the spring, right, I should be thinking as I compress that spring, I now have both a force and I have potential energy stored here. Right, so I've got both a force and I've got potential energy stored. As the spring then releases, that potential energy that the spring was storing is being converted. Right, It's being converted to another form of energy. So all we have to do is think about, well, what form of energy is that spring potential going to? Well, and the answer to that is it's going to kinetic energy because it's making the block move. Right, So that spring potential energy that I had stored is being converted to kinetic energy for the block. And again, that's the key relationship. As soon as you figure that out, this is a pretty easy question to solve. So I started with spring potential energy, one half kx squared, and that caused the uh, that came from the compression that I had there, and then that's converting to kinetic energy, which is one half mass times velocity squared. Okay, so again, all I'm doing here is I'm setting my spring potential that I stored equal to the kinetic energy that I end up with as the block leaves the system. So obviously, if I look at this equation, the nice thing is the one halves cancel out right there. The mass, however, does not cancel out, so it is significant that I have the mass, which they gave me. But otherwise, it's just a matter of plugging it in, right? So 78 times, again, the compression in terms of meters, so 0 0.02 meters squared, and then equal the mass of 0 0.085, and I'm looking for that final velocity. So it's just a, a matter of calculating this now, and I end up getting about 
0 0.61, 0 0.606 if you want to take it out to a couple places. Um, but obviously you could round it off at 0 0.61 if you wanted to as well. But again, just taking advantage of the relationship between forms of energy, right? It's the biggest theme in this chapter. It's something you need to get very comfortable with. If as you go through more and more of these you still don't feel very comfortable, just let me know so I can help you get some more practice with that. Okay, so for question seven here, a roller coaster type question. Hopefully not too bad, but um, it is important that you're comfortable interpreting this. So the most common mistake I tend to see setting this one up is sometimes we think that second hill is supposed to be taller than the first one, but just think it through. If it started at rest from the first hill and the second hill was taller than the first one, there's no way it could make it up the second hill because it wouldn't have enough energy to get up that, that remaining potential energy, right? So uh, this is the diagram that I should have set up for this one, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, but let me know if you do have any trouble setting that up. Anyway, it goes down the hill and then goes up the second hill that is 28.5 meters above the first drop. So again, above the bottom of the first hill. And at the top of the second hill here, so my second velocity, my final velocity, if you will, is 22.5 meters per second. And they ask me how high was the first hill, right? So what's my initial height here? Well, there's a couple different ways I could go about this. Ultimately, obviously, it's a relationship between energies. And so what I do want to think about for a moment is what types of energy does it have at both locations? Well, at the start of the first hill, the start at the top of that first hill, right, the only energy that it would have up there would be potential energy because it's not moving and there's definitely no springs involved, right? So it's not moving, there's no springs involved, so the only form of energy it would have would be potential energy due to gravity, right? Well, at the top of the second hill, that's where you have a little bit of a choice to make. You could either say that it has both potential and kinetic energy, or you could define the top of that second hill as your zero, right? We could define that as a zero, in which case, if that's zero, then there is no potential energy at that location. There is only kinetic energy. Again, it does not make any difference which way you choose to do it. If you choose to use the height of the second hill, then it would have both potential energy and kinetic energy at this location. If I choose to do it without the height of the second hill, so if I choose to define that as zero, then I just get potential energy of the first hill is equal to the kinetic energy at the top of the second hill. Okay, so it doesn't matter which way you choose to go. Ultimately, you just have to realize that it's all relative to whatever I'm defining to be zero. So I'm actually going to work it the second way just to simplify it a little bit for me. Right, the potential energy of the first hill would come from mass times gravity times height. The kinetic energy at the second hill would come from one half mass times the velocity squared. Obviously the mass remains constant unless they tell us otherwise, right? So that can cancel out. So 9.8 times the height, which is what I'm looking for, equals one half the velocity they gave me of 22.5 squared. So then when I solve for this, right, when I end up solving for this number, I just calculate and solve for h. I end up getting about 25.8 meters. So when I solve this equation, I end up getting about 25.8 meters. The only thing I have to be careful about is, again, what does this actually represent? Well, this would represent the height above the second hill, because I defined the second hill as zero. So this would represent the height above that second hill, is 25.8 meters tall. Okay, so if you wanted to represent the height that way, that would be fine, but I would definitely say above the top of the second hill. Right, so above the top of the second hill, I know I didn't get my of in there, but you guys hopefully are comfortable with what that means. If I was answering this though with respect to the ground level, right, I would still then need to take 28.5 plus the 25.8. So if I was trying to answer this in terms of the ground being zero, then my height would actually be uh, 25.8 again plus the 28.5, which gives me about 54.3 meters above the ground. Now it doesn't matter which way you choose to define it, as long as you are clear in, in your measurement. So again, if you choose the 25.8, make sure you're referencing the fact that that's above the top of the second hill. If you're choosing the 54.3, that's above ground level, right? So that's above the ground. Just make sure it's very clear which of those two you're working with. Now on a test or on the AP exam, it would be likely that they would probably define the zero for you, and you would want to be consistent with answering that in your, in your solution. Um, but either method here is fine. So hopefully not too bad, definitely getting the diagram set up, and I'll end this first part of the video on that question.